Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to the web conference on suture needles, small miscellaneous items, devices, and unretrieved device fragments. My name is Susan Wallace, and I'll be your moderator for this program. This webinar is the second of a two-part series about the prevention of retained surgical items. Uh, for an in-depth look about retained surgical items in Pennsylvania, please review the article Retained Surgical Items, Events, and Guidelines Revisited on the Authority's website. Uh, we welcome any comments or questions. All materials are provided for your educational use. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Bernice Gibbs, who is a professor of surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, and the founder and director of the National Surgical Patient Safety Project, No Thing Left Behind. Dr. Gibbs, I'll turn the program over to you. Great, thanks. Uh, the slides that you're going to see don't have the x-rays on them because we couldn't get them to Pennsylvania for some unexplained reason. So I'll try to tell you what the x-ray showed. So uh, this is uh, just a quick uh, slide that we used at the last um, session in case you didn't attend it. It's merely to show the global vision for why retained surgical items occur. The uh, nature of this is that um, there are multiple stakeholders and uh, this uh, was really useful for sponges but it applies actually to all types of retained surgical items. Um, the idea here is that there are um, stakeholders and they are primarily surgeons and nurses who are the primary defenders. And then radiologists are our secondary defenders that help mitigate harm. Should uh, show national findings, which uh, was the same slide we used last month. And this was just now to focus instead of on sponges, but to small miscellaneous items, devices, and unretrieved device fragments. And um, I've underlined the statement that they are the most commonly retained items. And um, you might uh, have a quibble with that um, if you looked at the first statement that said that the sponges are the most frequently retained items, but there's a qualifier to that. Actually, sponges are the most frequently retained items that cause patient harm. So those um, items are what are usually reported frequently in harms-based reporting systems, which is what a lot of the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority collects. So that's why it looks like there are more sponges. But in reality, there are more commonly retained small miscellaneous items, devices, and unretrieved device fragments, because that includes everything around the hospital. Um, <clears throat> this is gonna be the first parts on sharps and needles. So the next slide should have a picture of a needle graph, which is just really to illustrate what it is we're talking about. And to uh, point out my focus here should be to try to clarify um, ambiguity and uh, answer some of the questions which were always asked about this. Um, is, um, uh, does injury result from a retained suture needle? And um, that depends. Is an x-ray required if a miscount occurs? That depends. And is disclosure necessary for a lost needle? And that also depends. And I hope to answer those questions from um, this uh, talk. What's not a picture, but what it would have shown would be a retained needle in the eye. Uh, I'm sorry, in the pelvis. And uh, that was a picture that's actually in the first uh, slide deck uh, from the first PowerPoint from last month. Um, the uh, retained needles can cause symptoms. Uh, the picture was of a CT scan of a 34 millimeter needle, but uh, retained needles have occurred in the eye, which are incredibly small, four or five millimeter needles, needles after a thyroidectomy, retained needles in the pelvis um, that have led to hysterectomy. <clears throat> but all of the cases that we know of, that I know of through this project and through uh, reports, have been needles which have been greater than 15 millimeters in size. And the primary symptom has been pain. So uh, this is a case of a patient who underwent a laparoscopic Roux-Y gastric bypass. 
and during the procedure, a laparoscopic endosuturing device was used, and the surgeon did a visual sweep before closing and then was told that the closing counts were correct. At the final count, the surgeon was told that there was a missing needle and an intraoperative abdominal x-ray was taken, which was read as negative by a radiologist. The staff marked the count's missing needle x-ray negative, but the needle was never found. Nothing further was done about this. And if you came last month, you would know that that's a problem because that uh, final count can't be. We only have an incorrect or a correct final count, but that's part of the problem in the practices that are used by our team members. <clears throat> For weeks postoperatively, the patient complained of piercing right-sided abdominal pain and a sensation of something sticking inside of him or her. The patient got a CT scan, which showed a 24 millimeter retained intra-abdominal needle, and the patient underwent laparoscopic removal. So that's the needle, it's a big needle, and um, it caused symptoms, it caused pain. Um, These funny sensations are sometimes uh, disregarded by the doctors and they dismiss it, but uh, in this instance, they followed up and got a CT scan. So an incorrect final needle count means the either correct or incorrect, it can't be just missing. It's not a final count. So if it's missing, you've got to do something else to make sure it's not in the patient. And then you have to discuss the findings if you're the nurse with the surgeon and move the information up the chain of command. Hey, we never found that needle, it's still missing. And then the surgeon appropriately should um, discuss with the patient whether or not the big needle or the small needle is um, going to be a problem for them and whether or not they need to discover it, which could be done with CT scans because it's these metal needles of all sizes, or whether, say, it's a tiny needle, they don't think that's going to cause any problems. The risks of retention are um, of a, a large needle uh, or small needle, but large needles that oftentimes cause symptoms. But are there problems with having an MRI if a needle is left behind? And not so much because the needles are not full loops, so they don't heat with the uh, MRI. And um, they're not long and linear like a wire, so they also should not heat during an MRI. And um, they're, not, they, they're not totally ferromagnetic. Um, and then lastly, uh, if they've been in for a while, there's an inflammatory reaction that uh, takes place around them, so they uh, frequently won't move. And so there's less likely to have wobble or movement during an MRI. So the main problem might be an MRI, but it depends upon when that was taken. So here's another case, which is the more common problem with needles. This is a case of simple open anterior cruciate ligament repair that's a knee operation, and less than 20 needles were opened during the case. The closing needle count was called correct, and now we're at the final count, and there's a needle missing. But nobody knows what size it is. In fact, no one was actually sure what suture needle was missing only that they have fewer now at the end of the case than they had at the beginning of the case. The staff looked for the needles but did not find it, so two view x-rays were ordered. While awaiting radiologist read back, the surgeon said the needle wasn't in the knee, and this happens all the time. Why can't you get things right? And was instructing the anesthesiologist and the nursing first assistant to take the patient out of the operating room. The nurse says, no, they have to wait for the radiologist read back because the nursing team didn't find the missing needle. And then the surgeon says, well, you guys lost the needle. And then the anesthesiologist chimes in and says, well, it's not in there. And the orthopedic surgeon read the x-ray and said it's not in there. And if you don't like it, you can write me up and we're taking the patient to the PACU, which they did. I know that this scenario is alien to everybody on this call. They would never imagine that something like this could happen in their operating room. But this is the fact that this actually is more commonly a scenario. And indeed, the x-ray came back negative for the needle. They never found this needle. And they submitted an incorrect final needle count, but this one in the pile with all the other incorrect final needle counts, and nothing was ever done about this. 
So this is some data from a real hospital that I work with lots of hospitals around the country. And this was looking at all those incorrect needle count reports. Actually, it was all uh, incorrect count reports for a period of four years from 2012 through 2015. And you'll see far and away of the 65 events, 40, almost, um, almost 50 of them are related to needles. And um, it's not significant that um, from 2012 to 2015, those numbers increased uh, because 13, 14, 15, they were all about the same, but you can easily see that needles are at least five times more frequently the source of miscounts or incorrect counts above the next most common, which was some kind of instrument. So these, um, per, this data, supports the common perception that miscounts related to needles are the most common type of miscount in the operating room. And when this happens all the time, it becomes uh, normalized because everybody gets used to having to deal with the issues around missing needles. And this can cause anger and frustration uh, because um, we spend time looking and uh, we take x-rays, which never show the needles, either because they can't or the needle's not there. And uh, there's no change in the practices and it's part of the way that ORs may be doing business. So it's not just the nurses, it's the scrubs, it's the surgeons, and you can hear from this case, it's even the anesthesiologists. And this leads to um, an uh, uh, unsafe climate and um, can lead to disruptive behavior. So uh, this is a problem which is not the surgeon's fault, it's not the nurse's fault, it's a system problem which is worthy of our attention. Next slide to fix or to try to change. So what should we do? So um, we, re um, we recommend that you look at this problem if you have a lot of needle miscounts, and if you don't, then that's great. Look at your practice and share it with your neighbors. Uh, but if you do have a lot of needle miscounts, then you should look at changing your practice. And um, we want to recommend that you develop a rational needle management plan that will prevent lost needles and reduce the numbers of x-rays, because x-rays are not the solution they are part of the problem. And um, we think that this is the best effort for risk reduction. And one of the first steps you're gonna have to think about is determine a size cutoff where x-rays won't be taken for a lost needle in a large cavity. That's not a lost needle anywhere, that's a lost needle in a large cavity. That is the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis. And um, people kind of get confused about this, but when you're using suture during cases, the common practice is to speak about the suture size, which we know is 6-0 or 3-0 or 4-0. But when a needle is lost or missing, you have to discuss the needle by the size of the needle, not the size of the suture. And that speaks to, you don't have to know this. You don't have to memorize this. This is not an additional burden we're placing on nurses. But every box of suture has both the suture size, which in this box of 7.0 proline is an 8 millimeter needle. And the reason you need to know the size of the needle is because that's the information that is going to be transmitted to help the radiologist or to help you or your team members make a decision about what to do. Now that's important because suture can have multiple different size needles attached to it. And many of you may know this uh, from working in the operating room, but I point out here, everybody says, oh well, it's a 8 -0, 9 -0, 10 -0 suture, it's gonna have a little needle on it. But if you look down at the band, the long green band that stretches across, you'll see that there's some 10 -0 suture here that has 16 millimeter needles attached to it. So the uh, size of the suture is not the way to discuss when you're missing a needle. Not when we're working. If I'm saying, you know, I want 7-0 or 6 suture for this anastomosis, that's fine. But now we've lost a needle. You have to know what size it is. And uh, this is some work that was done in a model uh, of an x-ray model. This was not done in people. But uh, you can see that uh, very small needles can still be seen 
depending upon what they're seen against. So if they're against the bone, like the skull, um, then you won't see a seven millimeter needle. That's the end for no. But against the pelvis, against the soft tissue background with the right orientation, uh, V is barely visible um, and V is visible. You can see them. So it depends upon the background, the orientation, a lot to do with the way it's taken. So it's not a question of whether you can see it or not. It's more a question of what are you going to do about it. But this is just to say when someone says, well, it's a 10 suture, it can't have a needle that's big on it. The answer to that is yes, it can, and yes, they do. And yes, we want to speak about the size of the needle if we're missing something. Next slide. So this is a paper that was written uh, using a pig model. Again, this isn't in people, but uh, this was uh, putting needles in the pig and then having a group of radiologists reviewing the films. And they knew that they were looking for surgical needles. So this is even heightened awareness. Um, and they had various size needles. Next slide. And with this group of experienced radiologists knowing what they're looking for, knowing they what they're looking for, they had 195 needles that each reviewer looked at over the course of the time of the study. Um, that the size of the needle was a predictor for whether or not it could be seen. And only 29% of the reviewers were of the time, small needles, less than 10 millimeters, were identified, whereas those that were bigger than 10 millimeters, 11 to 24 millimeters, were seen with a huge jump in frequency up to 84%. And uh, a deeper drill down on that paper that came from UCSF, where I work, um, it was under 50% for needles that were less than 10 millimeters. So the really small needles, the uh, chance of seeing them on x-ray in a pig uh, were very low. So we've taken this and in and, and looking at clinical uh, studies and just to establish some baseline and some information, a taxonomy um, for uh, a way to, to speak about these. So for small needles, we consider a small needle a needle that's between 6 millimeters and 15 millimeters. Micro needles are those needles which are used during microscopic cases, that is where an operating microscope is usually used, would be from the smallest available size up to five millimeters. And large needles are needles that are greater than 15 millimeters, so 16 millimeters up to whatever the biggest needle you have in your system uh, that you're using. Uh, this is not the, the Bible, this is just a representation to show you what I'm talking about, that depending upon, and all of you, if you've worked in the operating room of the hundred or so people that are here, you know that there's different sizes and they're cutting and they're half circles, but this is just three I picked from a needle chart that um, there, you can have a, a cutoff for the ones that are greater than 15 millimeters, and those are the ones that we're calling large versus the ones that are small. And the next slide shows you a picture of what that looks like if you took a perfect x-ray. Uh, again, you wouldn't get these conditions in a real person, but it shows you again this difference <clears throat> in the size of the needle in relation to the intensity in a perfect situation. I put little yellow dots by those um, ones that are considered to be small. And you see that that eight millimeter needle at the top is, you could see it if you, you know, look closely, uh, but it's very hard to see. And if you imagine that in a real situation with soft tissue, with a mat on the x-ray table, and a person that would probably be near impossible to see. Okay, so the size cutoff that we recommend, if it's less than or equal to 15 millimeters, then it's considered a small needle. And then we would recommend something different is done with a small needle in a large cavity that's discovered to be missing than a large needle. So here's another case. This is a person who underwent a fempop bypass. And this is to illustrate the problem with needles. At the closing count, a hypodermic needle was missing. The surgeon didn't use any hypodermics during the case. After a search of the field, radiology was called. The radiology technologist wanted to use the C-arm to get the images before a second incision was made, but no one was sure if they could use the C-arm. They had to ask Judy. 
so they didn't use it, and the procedure continued without the miscount of the hypodermic being reconciled. At the end of the procedure, there was still a missing hypodermic needle, so radiology returned, and now that there were two separate incisions and the position of the patient has changed, they end up taking nine AP and four lateral views, that's 13 images, to get a complete region of interest. The images were read by a radiologist and called negative. After a review of the field, again, by a different circulating nurse, it was determined that at the initial count, the nurse couldn't remember if the hypodermic had been written on the whiteboard when it had been added to the case. So instead of stopping and looking at the packages and reconciling with the scrub, at that time, the nurse just defaulted and wrote again on the whiteboard that there were hypodermics added. So there were two needles written on the whiteboard, but really only one had been opened. And this reflects in-count errors, which are most common with instruments, but this is also common with reconciliation of packages and needles. This is from another hospital where we looked at, uh, for one year, the problem of discrepancies or counting discrepancies. And um, in this uh, hospital, over this period of a year, there were 24 total discrepancies that were reported. Now, we don't know if there were more that happened. We only know what was reported. And of those 24, there were 16 that involved um, 32 needles, 16 cases that involved 32 needles. So you know that there can be many more needles than there are cases. Um, and there were four sponge uh, discrepancies. One involved a ray tech, one involved a cottonoid, um, two involved cottonoids, one involved a, a round that was found in the garbage, cottonoids weren't found, and one involved a blade. And there were two instruments that were not found that were probably in count errors, and there was one case that they didn't do any counts because of policy. Of the 16 needle cases, uh, there were 24 total events. This is further data that needles uh, were 70% of the miscounts or discrepancies. So this problem of miscounts is driven primarily by needles. And of those needle discrepancies, there were almost 3,000 cases done for that year in this OR um, um, that responsible for about less than 1% of cases have a miscount. So miscounts aren't that frequent, but when they're frequent and they happen, it's needles. And this was a little deeper dive on this when they looked at it by surgical specialty. Turned out that the CT service had 50% of the events, eight of the 16 cases involved CT. And I have heard this over and over and over and over. The greatest frustration seems to be on the CT service, and that's where you might have the greatest input to make change. So here's a drill down, further data to support sorting of needles uh, and looking at things by size of those 16 needle cases. Now, in the 16 cases, there were 32 needles that were miscounted. At the beginning, when they had the 32 needles, the drill down on this were 12 of those 32 miscounted needles were reconciled just as recording errors, just like what I gave you that case description of. It was looking at the packet, they wrote the wrong number on the dry erase board, it was recorded incorrectly. So more than half of them are problems associated with the recording and reconciliation using the packages and what's written on the dry erase board. Now you've got 20 needles that haven't been reconciled by just recording errors, and of those 20, 12 of them were quote unquote found. Of the 12, eight of them were rectified by actually going through the needle packages and seeing how many of them had one or two needles on them. And so if you add the eight that were rectified with needle package review and the 12 that were reconciled by recording errors, that's 20. So 20 of the 32 needles are associated with practice errors in the counting and management of writing them or of using the packages has nothing to do with it possibly being retained in the patient. And that's important. And if you 
should start this work, you need to start with examining your miscounts in your OR because this data says that 70% of the needle miscounts are occurring and it's needles that are the problem. And then it says further that 63% of them are practice errors with just the way the needles are counted and writing them on the dry erase board and package reconciliation and that they have never been in the incision or near the patient to have been actually retained. And if you have a blind, get an x-ray if there's a needle miscount, you're taking x-rays like they did, those 13 x-rays when there wasn't even a hypodermic needle ever in the patient on the field or actually ever opened. Now, of the 12 that were found, I said eight were rectified with needle packages review, but four of them were actually um, physically found, if you will. They were really lost. And if you look at those, the sizes of those were big. So there was a 13 millimeter one that was found in the patient's chest. There was 17 millimeter on the floor and two 26 millimeters, one on the floor and one on the anesthesia cart. And it wasn't the anesthesiologist who used it. It popped off and ended up on the anesthesia cart. And guys, again, you know if you work in the operating room, a popping off needle and there being in strange places is not news. More importantly, of those 20 needles, go back to the top arrow, that were lost and never found, those were all small needles. Two were 13, two were nine, one was three millimeters, and three of them, we didn't know what size they were. So this points out that the majority of needle miscounts, 81% in total when you combine the two, are due to missing needles. And overall, about 63% of those are due to practice errors, which are the counting, the opening, the packaging, and reconciliation. Those can be prevented by better needle recording and management practices. And needles that are found are found uh, that are usually bigger, which makes sense to you. It's easier to find something that's larger. But lost needles, which are never found, we know the size is usually less than 15 millimeters. So they're lost, they're never found, and we don't have evidence that they cause symptoms. Uh, next slide suggests that this is the body of evidence that says it's okay to not get x-rays and pursue small needles lost in large cavities. So in order to do that, you have to have a plan. Needles coming back to the scrub person have to come on a needle holder to a safety zone. They have to be put in needle counting boxes. You want to keep the numbers low so you can manage them. And it's not acceptable at the end of the case to say, oh, we're missing a needle. And then you say, well, what size is it? Well, I don't know. So you have to know while you're working if you're going to use this approach to manage the needles, small versus large, differently. Uh, that's a pan. It's got to be plastic. It doesn't have to be that pan, but it's a good size pan because it holds most needle holders. Uh, the scrub person has to get the pan to the surgeon, not the surgeon has to stop and put it in the pan, so this is a close interaction. Don't use a pan that's made of metal. You can't just use any old thing. You can't use a kidney basin. It's got to be something that the whole needle holder fits into so the surgeon can put it in the pan. And the goal is to get the needle in the pan on the needle holder because now if it's in the pan, we know that it's not in the patient. And then the scrub person, um, we recommend they sort the needles, uh, small versus large. Next slide. And this is a 40 counter box. So you don't want 120 needle counter boxes. And you want the large needles separated from the small needles. And we've given you the definition of that is on the counter boxes, they reflect it. So the large needles on the foam side and the small needles on the magnet side. And that way you only put one needle in each counter slot. Don't double arm it if you have a double armed needle. Don't put two in one. And then when you get to 40, you can reduce the number on the count so that you're not managing number 165, 166, 167. Your numbers never get larger than 40. Next slide. So the idea here is you have a whole process for the management of needles. If your cases always use large needles, you don't need to sort them. Um, and you don't have to do this, but this is a way to try to get a grip on those CT cases that have 120 needles of various sizes. So the plan is you have to study how many miscounts you have. Is this worth the effort? 
and then to explore the practice change. So you need to keep the numbers on the back table low. You can do that whether you sort or not. Um, get rid of those 100 needle counter boxes and just get ones that are 40 or less. And then you want to know, you have to know whether or not the needle that's missing is large or small. If a miscount occurs, you must know what size needle is missing. So even if you're using 7-0 and you don't know what size needle that is, the CERC can go look at the box, a 7-0, oh, that's an 8-millimeter needle. So it's a small needle in a large cavity. If you're in the chest, the abdomen, mediastinum, if it's small, less than 15 millimeters, you don't need to get an x-ray. Uh, you won't see the needle usually, you probably won't be able to remove it, and the surgeon isn't going to go and likely remove it. And we have no evidence that that small 8 millimeter needle, 10 millimeter needle, 13 millimeter needle left in the large cavity causes any trouble. If it's a large needle, that is if it's greater than 15 millimeters, you've got to get an x-ray because you can see it. I've shown you pictures, you can see these and surgeons can usually remove them. Now, if it's in a small space, it's in the eye, if it's a micro needle, you gotta bring out the microscope, you shouldn't have put it away and look for it. And if it's a large needle, undoubtedly you've gotta find it because those will be symptomatic in small spaces. So in the arm or in the hand or in the leg, if you're using a large needle, you should be able to find it. Um, you want to keep your needle packages in one place to help reconcile any incorrect counts. And if you do not find the needle, it's an incorrect final needle count. You have to document that and then you have to disclose. Because <clears throat> um, if you don't know where it is, then you have to tell the patient and that usually is done with risk management or the surgeon. And then you can make a decision. The surgeon and the patient can say, well, this is a 15 millimeter needle and it's somewhere in your abdomen or it's a 10 millimeter needle uh, and we um, don't know where it is. It could be inside of you. And so if you want to know really where it is, we can get a CT scan because CT scans will see needles anywhere from four millimeters up. If a needle is lost, just the fact that it's lost is disclosure required. And the answer to that, it depends. So if you know with certainty that the needle is not in the patient, then you don't have to disclose just because you lost the needle or because you have an incorrect final needle count. And those circumstances would be when the needle was never near the incision, like those cases that I already told you about, those illustrations, or when the incorrect count involves needles that were never used or where there are more needles than what you started with. And another circumstance is if you're using this practice is if the needle and the needle holder got in the pan. The pan is off the field, the pan is not in the patient. If the scrub person lost control of the needle on the back table or never made it to the needle counter box, that needle can't be in the patient because you know, everybody knows the needle made it to the pan. So even if you have that needle miscount and it's lost, it's not retained because it was in the pan. And there's no requirement to disclose to the patient under those circumstances. So you don't have to take x-rays just because you're missing something, but you've got to know what the circumstances are around where it's missing and you need to improve the practices to prevent them from missing in the first place. So the best way to start is with miscount reports. Everybody hates them, you don't think they're worthwhile, you don't know what to do with them. You're gaining the data and insight into information of what's the problem in your OR with needles. And the default position is not just to get x-rays, it's to start to look and to understand, like I've shown you this work here that we've done with a number of other hospitals. Uh, around the country, the default I'm seeing is 15 millimeters, other centers have used 13 millimeters, but the move is to, just is generally to not take x-rays for these little needles lost in large cavities. But you must know with certainty the size. And if you've lost it and you're not sure that it's absolutely not in the patient, there's no chance it's in the patient, that's not always clear. Um, you have to disclose and tell the patient, yes, if you're a cardiac surgeon and you use that 7-0 proline with an 8-millimeter needle during the anastomosis and that needle never got back to the pan, while it may not cause any harm to the patient, you have to disclose to the patient. Next slide. And the disclosure part is what the doctors hate to do 
which is why there should be a great deal of enthusiasm in having a standardized practice in place. Because if they don't have to tell the patient, that's the part they hate the most. Um, and uh, if the patient really wants to know whether the needle's in their chest or in their heart or around their stomach, um, they can, you can get a CT scan. All right. So now, quickly, in my last 15 minutes or 10 minutes, I just want to go over some things about small miscellaneous items. Next slide. So these, uh, very quickly, are um, also known as miscellaneous items, and they include, like, everything on the field, Bovee scratch pads, vessel loops, rubber shots, all of those other things. They are often can be made of plastic. They're not radio-opaque. And the question is always, do you count that as an instrument or a small miscellaneous item? And that depends upon how it was introduced in the case. Next slide. And uh, this shows some examples of uh, different things which are often called small miscellaneous items. I will admit for some of you that are very technically oriented, there are some sharps there which aren't small miscellaneous items, and I accept that correction. Um, but these are Yankauer suctions and um, um, uh, vessel loops and uh, uh, nasal uh, suction bulbs that all may be on the back table, aren't all necessarily entering into the field, but when an item moves from the back table in or onto, in the patient or onto the field, then it must be counted. And I put the laparoscopic and thoracoscopic ports and trocars there because they too must be um, managed and accounted for. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just generally, um, the small miscellaneous items are those which are the other things that aren't sharps or sponges or instruments. And devices are actually anything else that's used during a case. Um, the uh, miscellane the mist trocars, uh, ports, Jackson Pratt drain, all of those are considered to be devices. I discussed this a little bit last month and used some illustrations. Um, and unretrieved device fragments are parts or broken parts or pieces of uh, tools or instruments. This was a question from uh, the field where a nurse was involved in a deposition for a retained small miscellaneous item. The uh, lawyer asked uh, the nurse in testimony, um, did the policy state that they needed to be accounted for or counted? And uh, the uh, lawyer asked, well, where is this documented? And the nurse uh, was quite uh, upset because uh, the answer was, well, we, we document sharps, instruments, and sponges, but there isn't a place in their intraoperative nursing record to document the miscellaneous items. And uh, the question to me was, should we? And the answer was, yes, in capital letters. If you're using a paper intraoperative record, there should be four areas or check boxes, whatever system is being used. And there should be a place to document each class of item equally. And so um, you know that you can have an incorrect, say, needle count, but you have a correct sponge, instrument, or small miscellaneous item count. So they, they, they are equal. And I've, I know that in some centers they don't have a means to document the small miscellaneous item counts, and so they have a, a, oh, just write it in or just free text that in, small miscellaneous item, correct. That's not acceptable. And this is just a paper record that I found that uh, had a place where they use a um, correct, incorrect designation for the final count. That's fine. But you'll see it's got sponges, sharps, and instruments. And then there's nothing on small miscellaneous items. So I guess they're supposed to write that in the comments section. And then I just uh, hand wrote on the graph on the right that, well, no, this fourth column, instead of that thing that says wave, should have miscellaneous items or SMIs that are correct and incorrect, just like the other items. And similarly, if you were in an EMR, this is Cerner field that we've reconstructed for a hospital system where you can see that each of the, uh, uh, the sponges, sharps, and instruments are treated equally. Uh, just to point out that we use the six counts. The names of the six counts are documented, so it's not first count, second count. It's initial cavity closing, final relief, and any time count, and those correspond with each of the particular surgical classes. Uh, sponges, small miscellaneous, sharp. So this is standardized. This is standard work, and this is not treating one differently than the other. 
So small miscellaneous items are frequently retained, and they're actually the most commonly reported. Uh, <clears throat> in the Pennsylvania system, uh, I believe that many of those or some of those have been bundled into instruments in the reporting. And in Susan's paper, there's mention in the beginning of them, but there's no greater drill down on what they are or how many of them there were. And in other uh, public records, um, you can find these cases also, but they're all bundled in with instruments. So it's hard to tell the instrument versus the small miscellaneous item. Next slide. But uh, in California, <clears throat> we do have one domain of public reporting which is uh, hospitals are penalized when they have something called a, um, uh, an, a places the patient in immediate jeopardy. And so those more severe cases when they get administrative penalties are posted on a website. And so of those administrative penalty cases, now those are the most severe cases, you wouldn't be surprised that most of them involve sponges because those cause harm. But of the 79 cases for that seven-year period, it wasn't actually seven years because the reporting only went up to 2011. Susan will know this very familiar. Even though you're looking at a year, the data comes from many years previously. But of those, 24 of the cases were small miscellaneous items and unretrieved device fragments. Nine of them were retained instruments, and seven of the nine cases of retained instruments were malleable retractors. And we talked about that last month. So um, I did a project with the California Hospital Patient Safety Organization trying to get better data. We reached out to other states and their uh, reporting, and we only got 67 cases from all these other states. Next slide. And even with that, the reporting is really terrible, and I know Susan can deal with this very well because the way that people put this information in is very sketchy. Um, even though they were reporting a retained surgical something, 20% of the cases had no information. 54% of them had a retained small miscellaneous item, which makes that the most common, again, data, not sponges. <clears throat> and 18% of them were near-miss cases. That is like, it sounds like it was there and they found it. But in other of the cases, we I couldn't tell whether or not they had removed the item it was retrieved or whether it was retained. But I will be able to say of those 67 cases of the 54 that were material, the orthopedic surgeons had the largest number, which is not surprising since they're working around bone. They had the most number of unretrieved device fragments. That's parts or pieces. And then the vascular proceduralists leaving guide wires, sheath stents, and parts of wires in vascular spaces was the second most common of the unretrieved device fragments. So here's a list. This is so unscientific, but nevertheless, it's the state of being. Um, it doesn't have percentages. It doesn't have risk. It says here's all the stuff that we have found, that I have found, it's not all, that have been left in people. And this is from various sources, but you can see for the small miscellaneous item category, uh, rubber shods, vessel loop, cotton tip applicators, stop cocks, marking pens, uh, miss uh, surgery, that's um, minimally invasive surgery, the trocars and the ports, Bovee scratch pads, rainy clips, the tip of a Bovee electrocautery, a piece of a plastic drape. For devices, slam dunk, the most common retained device are guide wires from central venous catheters from around the hospital, ICUs, emergency departments, uh, Jackson Pratt drains. If the drain fractures, that's an unretrieved device fragment. Usually they remove those. And then the junk, I mean, the unretrieved device fragments are parts or pieces of things a tip of a lumbaringoscope, a piece of a lumbar drain catheter. And we have lots of cases, like 10, 20 cases of little drill bits that have been left in bone. And then for the instruments, as I mentioned, the malleable retractors and fish retractors. So these are the most common stuff. And here's just a example of what we're seeing increasingly, um, which is unique, and I wanted to bring this to your attention in the state of Pennsylvania, if you guys are seeing this as well. This is remedial. remedial. This can be fixed. This can be remedied. Uh, this is a patient who underwent an uncomplicated uh, laparoscopic uterine ablation and a tubal ligation. At the end of the case, the counts were called correct. Postoperatively, the patient had pelvic pain and fever. 
and she was diagnosed with an endometrial infection, was treated with antibiotics. Um, the pain persisted for three months, and finally, after the procedure, the patient went to the emergency room. She was tired of dealing with her doctor or couldn't stand the pain anymore, and they removed this acorn tip from her cervix, which had been left there. Um, that's part of a uterine manipulator but at the time of surgery. And uh, we've seen this increasing. I've seen at least 10, 20 cases of this acorn tip. It's called various things that are left in the women's cervix. In the next slide, the other culprit is this aseptobulb syringe. The green part is uh, left. I have one case where the whole thing was left in the vagina, or the other common one is a nasal suction bulb that's left in the vagina. Next slide. And that's because the uh, laparoscopic uh, gynecologists, when they're doing a robotic or laparoscopic hysterectomy, when they need to close the vaginal cuff, they have loss of pneumoperitoneum if they've removed the uterus <clears throat> out through the vagina. Now, most surgeons or many gynecologists just use the uterus, use the fundus of the uterus itself, push it back up into the vagina and close the vaginal cuff. But these other gynecologists have come up with the creative solutions of sticking nasal suction bulbs and uh, aseptobulb syringes. And then they are passed to the surgeon and nobody is counting or accounting for them at the end of the case. So like all other small miscellaneous items, if you pass the aseptobulb to the surgeon, and that means it has to be counted and at the end of the operation, the dry erase board. If you have two aseptal bulbs, one in your aseptal basin and one in the vagina, you better have two aseptal bulbs syringes on the back table at the end of the operation. So a taxonomy, a way, how are we going to think about these cases? Um, what we've put together is that we talk about them on the basis of location. So it's not about what it is, whether it's a a drape, a piece of a drape or a suction bulb. It's where did the event occur? Because that's where we're gonna have a locus of action. And so we've sorted these by cases in the operating room or not operating room, that's anywhere else. And then within the OR, does the item radio opaque or non-radio opaque? Now, this is a picture of a, a wing nut in the patient's pelvis. I'm sorry, it's not there from our technical error. In any event, <clears throat> the, these, that's radio opaque, it's made of metal, and these small miscellaneous items you can see. So if they're missing, the obvious thing to do is to recognize that it's missing. So that's really on the back of the scrub person because the circulating nurse is out of the field. The surgeon is focused on the operation, and many times this material worked when it was used. But as it's passed back to the scrub person, they're the ones who can see and identify that the screw on the malleable, I mean, on the Balfour retractor is missing. And if you wait for the folks in SPD to discover that one part is missing, clearly that's really late because the patient's already out of the operating room. So the goal here is for the scrubs to look at the stuff that they're passing in before they're giving it to the surgeon and then examining it when they come out, when it comes back to them. And if they identify that something is missing or broken or looks funny, um, if it's made of metal, <clears throat> if it's radio opaque, get an intraoperative x-ray because you can see and find these things. But for non-radio opaque items, those are plastic things, um, rubber stoppers, eye protectors, tips. Some of this is made of plastic. Some of the stuff has radio opaque markers in it. And, and this particular picture was a chest X-ray with a, uh, a thoracoscopic trocar uh, or sheath in it that was left. It's made of plastic, and they didn't count ports, but they uh, should. So non-radiopaque items, again, we have to identify if something is missing. And again, it will usually be the scrub person. Now, you still should get an intraoperative x-ray because you may not be able to see specifically the item, but you may appreciate that there's displacement by other organs or structures. And if you don't and you never find this item, then you should consider telling the surgeon they should consider getting a CT scan. Because again, CT may not see it 
because it's not radio opaque, but they will see displacement of the surrounding structures or tissues, which suggests that there may be an abnormality there. You still have to report it as an incorrect final small miscellaneous item count, and then that moves up the chain of command. So we know that there's something else that has to be done. Now, every case should have a wound exam performed before closing, and that includes uh, if the vagina was entered or explored during the operation, it should be examined at the conclusion to make sure that there's nothing that is left behind in the next slide. And this is a, uh, a methodical wound exam primer guidelines, three steps. Um, we spoke about this last month. It's the thing the surgeon should do uh, at every case. Uh, no matter what size the wound or the incision. And in terms of the scrub person, they are the content experts on the material that's passed back and forth, and they should check on the condition of it. They don't have to know explicitly how the item is used, but they're assessing its condition, and they have an active engagement in the management of these passing back. They're not just there passing stuff back and forth, and they have to speak up and question if, there's a, if they're missing something. The stapler comes back to them, but it's missing the stapler head. That's worthy of understanding the stapler has two or three parts. You've got two parts back. You're missing a part. You got to speak up because the stapler head is in the rectum. We intended for the stapler, uh, the staples to be there, but we didn't intend for the whole head to be left there. Now, one way to help the scrub people uh, do that is to organize the back tables. And that is something that is individual to each institution, not to each person. And so it's not your table, it's not my table. This is the way I always do it. You want to have the instruments in one place, the sponges, the small miscellaneous items. That is standardized for the type of operation. And when you do a change in scrub person, the new scrub doesn't come in and switch everything around. Well, I like my sponges over here and I like my trocars over there. Um, there's a unified agreement that this is the way we're going to set up our back table so that you have a greater chance. Set yourselves up for success, not for failure, in recognizing if something is missing rather than hoping that it will be discovered. And so this is just an example from another hospital where they do pictures, they set up their back tables, everybody does it the same way for the particular type of case, so general surgery and neurospine, whatever they are. And then when they have change and relief, you don't get to switch it all around the way you want it. You only want to keep it standardized to help everybody recognize if there's a problem. So for devices, uh, they are uh, those are the non-OR usually, and they can be lost in the vessel, intravascular space, or interstitial spaces. So intravascular can be both in the arteries, that's what the cardiologists are doing as they're sending their sheets and stents around, and for the um, veins is where we're working when we're putting in central venous catheters, and um, <clears throat> in Interstitial spaces are usually these tunneling devices for the placement of ports or for uh, types of pain control or for needle localization and breast tissue. And then, of course, all of our drains and different types of catheters move through an interstitial space. And the most common is a guide wire. And this is a picture, actually, there's this picture, this x-ray is in the first uh, webinar. This is just a picture of a guide wire that's left in um, the point there being that um, you have to recognize them early because the radiologist can remove these, IR can remove these more than 90% of the time if they're recognized early. And so you want to have some mechanism to prevent retained guide wires, which are the most commonly retained device. And the first is on the uh, person who's putting in the guide wire, the proceduralist, and that is to check at the end for the presence of the guide wire because they usually, in all of the cases where there's retained guide wires, they don't recognize that the guide wire has moved out of their uh, view and is in the patient. So you need a system now to mitigate harm, and that is for the proceduralist to check that they have the guide wire and then a second set of eyes so um, in our centers, we recommend the nurse who's um, <clears throat> monitoring, say, the CLABSI protocol for central venous catheter insertion. You have a, a 
checkbox there that says the guide wire is in the kit. So another set of eyes has to see the guide wire. And if you don't see a guide wire, then <clears throat> you've got to get a um, immediate post-procedure image. <clears throat> it's not usually a problem for a chest x-ray because they often get those. The problem is in femoral line insertions because many proceduralists don't get images after putting in a femoral central line when um, <clears throat> you think everything is fine. But if you're missing the guide wire, you must get an image to try to determine whether it's indeed in the patient because that's the time to remove it. Okay, so this is just a picture of an infusion device as an on cue pump. When they're pulled, oftentimes the uh, uh, interstitial parts or pieces can be left behind. And the reasons for these are usually 99% of the time it's provider error, the way in which the device has been placed or the way in which it's been trying to be removed. <clears throat> points to if the provider used the device correctly, but there's an intrinsic problem with the device. Uh, a defect by the manufacturer, worn or used equipment, and that's why you want to report these device uh, problems or unretrieved device fragments um, to MedSun so that there's a record that can be kept uh, that's by the FDA of when there may be problems with the actual devices that many, many centers across the country will report. The device fragments in and of themselves are not innocuous. They can um, cause a tissue reaction. They can cause infection. If they're in the vein, they can cause thrombosis. Uh, or they cannot move and be completely inert. But the fact remains that um, this is just a patient who had a small um, fragment that's left from a, uh, a needle insert, needle holder insert, which shows the small size of the fragment from the needle holder insert. And on the chest x-ray, it just shows just this dot that looks like a bullet or just a metallic fragment. And that was just kind of blown off by the radiologist called it, but nobody did anything about it. And that uh, subsequently got infected and led to the patient having to have a lobectomy. Um, so if you wait till SPD discovers this, it was way too late. Um, but this would be something a scrub person could have recognized as soon as that needle holder came back and you would see that it's missing the insert. So these uh, device fragments, when they're missing, even if you decide to leave them there, the surgeon says the risk of retrieval is greater than the risk of leaving them there, you should disclose to the patient. You have to tell the patient that the drill bit is left in their head um, or that the little device uh, part or piece of the uh, object is left inside of them and that as the doctor you don't think that will cause them any harm or if there's any problems you'll remove it or a plan. You can't pretend it didn't happen. And um, this is just to point out the Joint Commission and the National Quality Forum both uh, don't require these small parts or pieces to be reported. That is, you don't have to report them to your state, but you have to tell the patient. The idea here is if you're going to tell the patient, you have to know what to tell them. Next slide. And this points to uh, information uh, that you need to get. And this uh, sign that you see is on the Nothing Left Behind website. It speaks about action plans to help the humans do the right thing. Um, when something is missing, what to do, uh, get an x-ray, get the serial number, report it to MedSun. It's a memory jogger to help everybody get it right. And this is just the website to report to the FDA. This is voluntary reporting, um, but they have lots and lots of information. I pulled down just some information from 2015 and 2016 of all types of guide wires and catheters and stuff that's been lost and hurting people, causing death, um, uh, that if you check this, if you have a problem with a particular instrument or device or you had a problem with an instrument or device, you report it to MedSun and this is how some of the stuff gets taken off the market or we identify that there are problems. And this also then has information on what to tell the patient. Um, you have to tell them that that little unretrieved device fragment is in there. And then um, if you take an x-ray now in 10, 20 years, because it may not be where it was 10 years ago, they won't be upset or worried. And if there's any potential for injury, 
and any procedures or treatments that they need to have or should be avoided because the stuff does not always remain inert, quote unquote. So um, I pushed patient disclosure both uh, beginning and end last month and this month because we have an obligation to share what we know with our patients because it's their bodies and we respect the autonomy that they have in deciding what they want done with their bodies to preserve their health and well-being. And uh, while we may be ashamed of our error or be uh, concerned for our reputations and the hospital's reputations, you have an obligation if you leave something in a patient to tell them. And the advantages of telling them is that beyond the right thing to do, sometimes it doesn't seem like it's a good idea, but it is. And I just want to share, there are two examples here which you can savor as you read back through this uh, presentation at your leisure. The next one is one that uh, resonates highly with many, is uh, a patient who had an open reduction and internal fixation of a badly comminuted ankle fracture. And during placement of the hardware, one of the small screws was lost. And the surgeon looked and irrigated but didn't find the screw and thought <clears throat> he couldn't find it or she couldn't find it, reasoned that the risk of further looking and retrieval was greater than the risk of retention. So another screw was used and the rest of the hardware and the operation was finished. The small miscellaneous item count was incorrect because they knew they were missing a screw, and the surgeon sat down with the patient and said, we lost the screw. Um, the patient was told that there was already a lot of metal in the ankle, and it was unlikely that this screw was going to cause any problems. And then about three weeks later, the patient showed up in the doctor's office with a screw palpable just under the skin. And the patient said, hey, doc, here's that screw you lost. And the screw was removed under local anesthesia in the office. Knowing what to expect, the patient wasn't concerned when the screw became palpable. Rather than not telling the patient, the patient seeing the screw becoming palpable, thinking maybe that their repair was falling apart or something was wrong. So an advantage to disclosure. And then if you know that you're going to have retention, specifically this is addressing pacemaker wires that are not going to be removed for a generator change or staples. The case here was staples after burn wound grafting. You can put that in the consent process. And yes, we're not going to remove the pacemaker wires. So the perspective of this, I don't have really good data on this yet, but we've seen that as we've been telling and enforcing and nudging to get disclosure done, as the surgeons and doctors and cardiologists all recognize that they've got to tell the patient, we've seen a decrease in the number of unretrieved device fragment cases where the doctors have said, oh, the risk of retrieval is greater than the risk of retention. So strangely enough, in the face of having to disclose something that was once unretrievable, now apparently isn't. So we have to work together, whatever it takes, to make sure, as reasonable as we can, that there is no thing left behind. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. And uh, that does conclude this slide presentation. Uh, I know that we did, uh, we are going over, but I did want to give at least five minutes for any questions uh, that you might have out there. And we'll go to this one question, if you don't mind, Dr. Gibbs. And I did want to point out as well that in Pennsylvania, we do have the PACER system, the patient Pennsylvania state reporting system. And in that system, we do require reporting of incorrect counts for needles, sponges, and equipment. And if those are deemed serious events, those are automatically then disclosed to the patient. But um, I understand what you're saying, Dr. Gibbs, to disclose any of these events. All right, so here is the question in an ASC, um, I guess an ambulatory surgery center that has only a C arm. Would a C arm check be acceptable for immediate count errors and follow up with a CT post op if unresolved count? And it just goes on to say there's no radiologist, so the operating surgeon would be doing the C arm check. Operating surgeon dictation should reflect this check and outcome correct. Um, and of course, <laughs> patient disclosure. 
Right, so the correct, the correct is the correct. So if you're in an ambulatory surgery center, uh, those are, if you're missing something and you only have C-arm capability, then clearly that's what you're going to use. The uh, caveat to that is if you find it, you're great. That's great. The problem is if you don't find the missing surgical item. And the problem with the surgeons reading those images, of course, is there's a lot of bias and that they frequently don't see, even though their brains are supposedly working, that they're looking, they actually, depends upon their frame of reference, either they believe it's there or they don't believe it's there, but that affects their ability to see, um, and that's why you want independent verification. So if you're in an ambulatory surgery center, those C-arm images that they use should be saved. It can be entered to a file and saved, and those could be re-reviewed by a uh, radiologist. And uh, again, depending upon what the missing surgical item is, um, having that disclosure discussion with the patient and then deciding everybody doesn't have to get a CT scan. It's only recognizing that if the patient really is concerned or the doctor's concerned or you really want to know that the CT scan is a viable option, be a non-radio-opaque item or a radio-opaque item. So the goal is just don't not do nothing. Um, if you use the C-arm, capture the image and save it, have it read by an affiliated radiologist, and if you never find the item, then have the discussion with the patient and the surgeon and the patient can make the decision. Okay, uh, there is one other question where someone had joined at slide 11 and what they're asking is, are you advocating PAC reconciliation for missing needles to spare the x-ray? <laughs> so um, the, I'm not sure where they came at. I, I don't have slide 11 in the back of my head. Let me, I have slide 11 in front of me. But yes, you have to use the PACs. Um, the, the AORN wording is very deceptive, and that's the problem. It says you can't use PACs for reconciliation of the count. But what they're saying is poorly worded. I don't know what your policies say. Yes, you must save the packages. You're not, what they mean by this statement is you don't count the packages. Like if you have 10 packages, that doesn't mean you have 10 needles. So that's what they mean by packs should not be used to reconcile the count. You have to have the packages. One, because they tell you how many needles were in the package. So if you have some packages that had five needles and some had two needles and some had one needle, that information is on the packages and you use that information from the packages to guide your reconciliation. So um, yes, you must use a pack reconciliation for um, the information on the packs to help you reconcile the quote unquote needle count to help you sort out the problems that are before you. And uh, if they had, uh, let's see, if they were went to slide 24 where we broke down an analysis of the different types of miscounts involving needles, you'll see that 60% or more than 60% of them between getting it straight on what's written on the board, which are usually communication problems between the scrub and circ, is the case that I used as an example, as well as looking at the packages and sorting through that to reconcile your numbers. Yeah, you, the, the default is not to get an x-ray because in the cases I demonstrated here, there was no chance the needle was in the patient. It was just because of nursing count confusion. And why should we subject the patient ourselves and the um, doctors and staff to unnecessary x-rays? So yes, you need to save the packages in a place and you use that as a source of information for um, what numbers you're trying to work out. Okay, great. All right, I don't see any other questions, Dr. Gibbs. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you.